Well, tonight, in one hour, we're going to cover over 2,000 years. And uh, it's going to be easy. We just fly right through. So uh, let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into the, into the lesson. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that it is reliable. Who can question any of his word? And yet, people do. We pray, Father, that you'll use this time tonight to help us to be confident that your word in everything that you say is true. And we pray that the lessons that we have here in this first book of the Bible will minister to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> well, the book is Genesis, and the word Genesis comes from a Greek word meaning to be born, and hence the origin or the coming into being of something and in the book of Genesis, we have the account of one who had no beginning, uh, bringing everything into being that had no existence before. The word beginning in Genesis refers to the beginning of creation. God was the only being who was there at the beginning. And uh, in the beginning, God created. So only he can tell us how he brought everything into existence. He inspired Moses to write exactly what he wanted him to write. This account uh, cannot be discovered by scientists or scientific investigation. It can't be repeated. No one was present when he created. So we have the Genesis account of creation written by Moses as the Holy Spirit bore him along to write exactly what God wanted him to write. What God has told us in Genesis is clear and not really hard to understand. The problem with understanding Genesis comes from man, not from God. One of the problems that man poses is to say that Genesis chapter 1 is poetry and therefore should not be taken literally for poetry often does use figurative language. Uh, for instance, they, they might say, day does not mean a 24-hour day, uh, it's a longer period of time. And, or the chronology of Genesis uh, chapter one doesn't fit with the scientific uh, theory of evolution. No, it's, I, I don't even want to call it scientific, it's a theory of evolution. Uh, that could be, uh, so it shouldn't be t taken literally is what they would say. Stephen Boyd surveyed Hebraists, that's people that are experts in Hebrew, uh, their descriptions of poetry and narrative, and he applied it to Genesis chapter 1, 1 through Genesis 2, 3. And he found that the probability that, Genesis, that this Genesis passage is narrative is over 99.5%. So Genesis chapter 1, there's no question, is a narrative. It's written as a story that is meant to be taken literally. In other words, there are six literal 24-hour days of creation. Each day had an evening and a morning. Seems like the text is going out of the way to show a 24-hour period. And... I think that Exodus 20, verse 11, supports this quite well. It's uh, a strong biblical support for literal understanding of the six days of creation, where it says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Creation week became the pattern for the Jewish work week. Another approach that is taken to expand the time in Genesis is to say that the genealogies in chapter 5 of Genesis and chapter 11 have gaps. In other words, it's not a consecutive thing. It's, it's, uh, there, there's spaces in there, and it's a lot longer time than it would appear to be. Well, there's two types of genealogies. One of them 
it might have some gaps. One of them might just be to kind of trace your family uh, history. But the, the other one, which we have in those two chapters, has numbers that are, I don't know how you could get, get around to say they're not consecutive. You've got, uh, uh, you've, you've got the age at which this man had this son, and then you've got the age when that son had another son. And, and there, how can you put gaps in there? I, I don't see how you can do it without doing violence to the text. So uh, we have assumptions, and that'll be our first slide. Uh, we have assumptions, we, we have three assumptions that we, when we determine, uh, when, when we're determining biblical chronology, chronology. and uh, one is that Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3 is narrative and not poetry. The second assumption is that creation days are 24 literal days, 24 hour days, I mean, six 24-hour days. Genealogies of Genesis 5 and 11 are complete with no gaps. Those are our assumptions. And then we have, uh, hmm, okay. I've got a lot of the slides here on, and I'm, I'm getting a, a little bit behind my, or ahead of myself here. Uh, so these, these uh, are surely complete genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11 and can, are, are good to use for the determining passage of time with no gaps. And so Stephen Boyd writes, were it not for the unproven and unprovable theories of evolution, uh, nary biology, geology, cosmology, and the, the faulty but rarely challenged assumptions of radioisotope radio dating, no one would be questioning what kind of text or age of the earth, the, or how old the earth is. By the way, how did Jesus understand the age of the earth? Uh, in relation to the creation of man, he says, here's what he says in Mark 10, 6, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. He evidently knew that men and women were created on the earth at its very beginning. Also, the Apostle Paul wrote, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes and eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what was made, so that they are without excuse. To whom were God's attributes made known since the creation of the world? Well, to, to human beings. If there were no human beings there, it wouldn't be doing that purpose for which it was created. We now want to follow the flow of the book of Genesis. So we'll take a look at the slide on the Toledotes. The, uh, the word that Moses used the word Toledo 12 times in Genesis, and Toledo is a Hebrew word that means successive generations or origins. And usually the Toledo has a man's name followed by his descendants. The, however, the first one in Genesis 2-4 is referring to the origin of the heavens and the earth. So in, in the, the first one is uh, five, one, or uh, for, no, the first one's two, four, the generations of the heaven and the earth. The second one is five, one, the generations of Adam. The third one is six, nine, the generations of Noah. The, the fourth one's uh, ten, one, it's the uh, generations of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Genesis 10, 20, 32 is the generations of nations. And eleven ten is the generations of Shem, 11 to 27, the generations of Terah, 25, 12, the generations of Ishmael, 25, 19, the generations of Isaac, 20, 36, 1, the generations of Esau and Canaan, and then 36, 9 is the generations of Esau and Edom, and then 37, 2 is the generations of Jacob. So this is the order, this is kind of going to be our guide through the book of Genesis tonight. So we now want to follow this flow, and uh, the first Toledot 2.4 is referring to the origin of the heavens and the earth. And uh, 
Let's see, the, the, uh, the New Testament uses two of these genealogies that we mentioned, the lineage of, uh, of the promised Messiah from Adam to Christ in, in uh, Genesis chapter 5, and uh, it contains an, the uh, Adam to Noah, rather, Adam to Christ for, uh, is the entire link in Genesis, or in Matthew, rather. The uh, Genesis 11 is the genealogy from Shem, who is the son of Noah, to Abraham. And then Matthew 1 carries the genealogy from Abraham to Christ. So there, there in Matthew, we've got Abraham to Christ. And then Luke, in, in his third chapter, Use, uh, goes in reverse order, starting with Christ, and goes back to Adam. So we've got uh, generations in, in uh, the New Testament that rely on the old. Now, in slide, the next slide, the slide of the, uh, the uh, chronology, or the, uh, yeah, the chronology. If you, uh, in the chronology, we see that Abra or, yeah, Abraham is halfway between creation and Christ. That's, that was kind of eye-opening to me when I saw that. 2,000 years after creation was when Abraham lived, and that's 2000 B.C. Uh, of course, his life extended over, over 175 years, so it's on, he's on both sides of that, that line there. And then you can see the, the, the book of Genesis covers 2,360 years from the creation to the death of Joseph. And that's, that's what we're going to cover tonight, that first 2,500 years. So we, we end up... Uh, Joseph, by the way, is kind of halfway between Abraham and, uh, and the Exodus. And whoever does Exodus next time will, will be starting shortly after that, after Joseph dies. An interesting sidelight is how the uh, lives of many of the men in these gene genealogies overlapped. So if we have the slide on the overlaps. In, in this slide, we, we see Adam living until the, de the birth of his great, 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 great grandson, Methuselah. Methuselah was born before Adam died. And... Uh, and actually, he died the year of the flood. So you can see that people knew their ancestors. They knew their great ancestors and their great, great ancestors. The, uh, it's interesting that after the flood, uh, we've, we've got uh, Shem was born about 100 years before the flood. But his, he didn't die until Abraham died. Abraham was born about 300 years after the flood, and he died uh, some, some, several years, quite a few years before Shem died. Shem had a long life. But we see the ages of men complete, uh, begin declining after the flood so that they don't live near as long. Uh, you notice in, in this, uh, there's a man named Peleg. Uh, he lived in 1758, or I think he was, that's probably when he was born, rather, 1758. In his days, it says, the earth was divided. And I think it's best to understand that as the Tower of Babel, when God scattered the nations. And, and you can see that, that, that he was born shortly before the Tower of Babel. Uh, so uh, just some interesting th things. Now, we'll go back to our chart of the Toledotes, uh, and we'll follow the, this chronology of the, of the book of Genesis. So the first Toledote is the creation of the heavens and the earth in chapter 1. Uh, it follows chapter 1. Fo chapter 1 is a chronological account of the creation they, uh, through the six days. Chapter 2 gives us more details about the uh, conditions on the earth, uh, the creation of man and woman, the, the, their, uh, li the, what life was like before the fall, and what things on the earth were like before the fall. Several things to consider that 
uh, uh, that there was no shrub or field uh, plant of the field had sprouted during that time. And then for, this, for two reasons, there wasn't any rain and there was no man to cultivate the ground. Instead, a mist rose up from the earth, watered the whole surface of the ground. And when Adam was created, he was placed in the Garden of Eden where there were abundant trees for food. And Adam was to cultivate the garden. He was not at this point to cultivate the plants of the field. That would happen after the fall. God formed Adam from the dust of the earth, but he made uh, Eve from a part of Adam's body. And this is the, the institution of marriage, man and woman, till, uh, till death do you part. Chapter 3 of Genesis records the fall and the changes that occurred in man's life and, and on earth because of the fall. Man's relationship with God was changed. He was afraid and he sought to hide from God. The serpent was cursed to crawl on his belly and eat dust all his life. It's interesting that during the millennial period that the serpent still eats dust. It's a descendant of the uh, uh, of the woman would be born who would bruise the serpent on the head, but the serpent would bruise him on the heel. This is the first indication that God is going to do something to remedy man's fallen condition through the seed of the woman. We should look for and notice the development of God's plan of redemption, the promised seed of the woman, as we go through Genesis. As you go through the rest of the Bible, uh, that's really the whole line of redemption in the Bible is the seed of the woman and follow that seed to, uh, through, through from Adam on. The woman would have uh, pain in childbirth and there would be conflict in marriage. The, cursed, the ground would be cursed so that it would bear thorns and thistles and man would have to work hard for a living to, to provide food. He would, also be, he would also return to the soil when he dies. He goes back to dust. And uh, he is sent out of the garden to cultivate the ground and he would eat of the plant of the field, a new food for him now. And I would assume that because uh, that he's now cultivating the land and he's gonna eat the plant of the field, that rain began after the fall. Before the, uh, you know, sometimes you hear that the rain, the, there's no rain until the flood, but I believe that there was probably rain, it's just there was no floods like that one except one time in the earth's history. And God placed a cherub, cherubim at the uh, entrance of the garden with a, with a sword that goes every direction. I'm not sure how a sword goes every direction, but maybe he was just swinging it around, I don't know. But it was to protect the way to the tree of life. And uh, it's interesting, at the end of this whole story of redemption in the uh, eternal state, man will again, redeemed man, will again have the right to the tree of life. In chapter uh, 4, Eve gives birth to the first two children ever born. Cain was a tiller of the soil, and Abel was a keeper of flocks. Both boys sacrifices, made sacrifices to the Lord. Cain from his crops, Abel from his animals. God had regard for Abel's offerings, but he had no regard for Cain's. Cain became angry and uh, downcast, and rather than mastering sin as God had counseled him to do, he let sin control him and he killed his brother. So Abel was the first righteous um, man to die for his faith and Cain was the first murderer. God cursed Cain from the soil and he became a wanderer. Cain feared that man would kill him and God was gracious to him placed a mark on him so that no, no one would kill him. And he uh, was allowed to marry and start a civilization east of Eden. Adam and Eve then had a third son named Seth, and his descendants would be the one that, that leads to the, the, the line of the seed that would bring redemption. Uh, Seth had a son named Enosh, and in his days, men began to call on the name of the Lord. 
Chapter 5 begins a second Toledot, and that's the generations of Adam. It contains the genealogy from Seth through, Eno, uh, through Noah. In chapter 6, mankind was, uh, had reached the depths of depravity. God saw that the wickedness of the man's heart was great and that every intent of the thoughts of his hearts was only evil continually. I don't know how it could get worse. Verse 9 brings us to the third Toledot, 6-9, the generations of Noah. Noah was the only man whom God found righteous on the earth at that time. And he may have been walking for God, with God for about 500 years by the time of the flood. The, God said to Noah, I, I'm going to wipe out all the people, all the land animals, all the flying animals, by a cataclysmic worldwide flood. Now the Hebrew word for this that's used here is mabul. And the word mabul is only ever used of the cataclysmic flood of Noah's day. And it's only used in Genesis and in Psalm 29 where it says that Yahweh sat as king at the flood. Uh, there's, it's used, uh, there's an, uh, other words for flood, for local floods and things like that. That is also shows up in the Bible. But this word is specific for this flood. And uh, he promised, though, that there would be seasons as long as the earth remains after the flood. Capital punishment was established because of God's image in man. It made it a special crime for man to kill another man. And the, the, the death penalty would be an appropriate punishment. Now, man may eat meat before it was just, uh, he was a vegetarian before. So were the animals. So Noah lived 500 years after the flood, and we begin to see the decline of man's lifespan after the flood. This brings us to the fourth Toledo in chapter 10, <clears throat> the generations of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. These three sons that were, they were born, uh, they had some sons born to them after the flood, of course. These were all, these men were all born to Noah about a hundred years before the flood. Here we learn that Ham, was the youngest son of Noah, is the ancestor of the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, the Philistines, and that his kingdom was uh, Babel in Shinar, which is over in Mesopotamia. Uh, he, he also built Nineveh in Assyria. Shem was the older brother of Japheth. Japheth's descendants settled in Eastern Asia along the upper Euphrates River, uh, the island of Cyprus, Greece, and Spain. And uh, there's some indications that they were also some of the maritime people. Shem was the ancestor of the Semitic people. They settled in Elam, which is northeast of the Euphrates River, uh, Aram, Uz, and Eber is the ancestor of the Hebrews. His son, Joktan's sons, point to South Arabian Peninsula. And uh, the, the uh, other son, Eber, is, uh, or the other son of Eber is Peleg. And he's the one that, that showed up uh, in the seed line from Shem to Abraham. And the text says that in his days the earth was uh, divided, and we've already mentioned that, which leads us to the next Toledo, the scattering of the people at the Tower of Babel. So the fifth Toledo, the generations of the nations, tells how the nations, and this is in chapter 10, began and they were separated by the Lord at Babel. It, uh, in contradiction to God's purpose, the people united uh, to, to, to make a great name for themselves. They were uniting against the Lord's um, clear direction, and he confused their language so that they could no longer communicate their evil intentions. The sixth Toledo, the generations of Shem, is uh, the genealogy which leads to Abraham. We now uh, can trace the lineage of the seed promise from Eve in Genesis 3.15 through Seth to Noah, then from Noah's son Shem to Abraham, in whose seed all the families of the earth would be blessed. We continue to see God's plan unfold to provide a savior as time passes. This will continue to be seen throughout the rest of the Bible. Seventh 
Toledo in 1127 is the generations of Terah, beginning a long section of Genesis centering on the patriarch Abraham. God uh, called Abraham to leave his home and family in Mesopotamia and to go to a land that he would show him. He promised to make him a great nation, to bless him, to make him a blessing to all the families of the earth. So Abraham and Sarah entered the land of Canaan when Abraham was 75 years old. As uh, at Shechem, God promises that the God promises him that this land where he has entered will be given to his descendants. And Abraham immediately becomes a worshiper of God. He builds an altar. He calls upon the name of Yahweh, and this becomes a practice for Abraham wherever he goes. Abraham is cited in the New Testament as a man who had faith. In Hebrews 11, we read, "By faith he obeyed God and went out to a land, foreign land." And then in Romans 4, we read that without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet, with respect to the promises of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. How did this man who came from an idol-worshiping family, uh, become such a man of faith um, in the one true God. This, I think the book of Genesis reveals a number of things that contribute to this. One is that, he, first of all, he was called by God. His faith was a response to God's call on him. Another was that he repeatedly heard God's word and his promises God repeated to Abraham on numerous occasions his promise to make his seed numerous, to bless him, to protect him, to bless all the families of the earth through his seed. Another factor was time. With the passing of time, Abraham received progressive revelation. After the, he first entered the land, he was promised the, the, the land to give, that would go to his seed. After Lot separated from uh, Abraham, God promised to give him the land to his seed forever. Abraham uh, rescued Lot from the uh, kings of the east, and there, then God said, Do not fear, Abraham. I am a, a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. It was at this point that Abraham said to Yahweh, O oh Adonai Yahweh, what will you give me since I am childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Since you have given me no seed to me, one born in my house shall be my heir. Now Abraham had seed promises, but he had no seed. This is when God revealed to Abraham that his heir will come from his own body. God takes Abraham outside and tells him to count the stars, and he says, so shall your seed be. At this point, Abraham believed God, and God uh, reckons it to him as righteousness. Then God reminds Abraham, I am Yahweh who brought you out of, the land, uh, out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. But Abraham wants more assurance that he will possess the land. So he asks, how may I know that I will possess it? God gives Abraham assurance by cutting an unconditional covenant with Abraham. He, was, he has Abraham bring a heifer, a goat, and some birds. He cuts the heifer and the goat in two, laying each piece, each half, opposite one another. And there's, there's evidence in the uh, Middle East that uh, when two, two people cut a covenant this way, they pass. They both pass between the pieces, and what what it signifies is, may I be cursed if I do not keep my end of the covenant. You might even say, may what happens to these animals happen to me if I don't keep the covenant? Now, in this, and that's a bilateral covenant. Covenant, but in this case, God is the only one who passes between the pieces. This is a unilateral covenant. This is a promise that God will keep his promise. It doesn't even depend on Abraham. In 
In addition, he gives Abraham further revelation. He, uh, he, said, uh, he, he's, he's, he tells Abraham, your seed is going to be enslaved and oppressed in a strange land for over 400 years. But God will judge the nation who enslaves them, and he'll bring Abraham's seed back to the land of Canaan. After being in the land for 10 years, Sarah hatched a plot for Abraham to produce a child for her through her maid, Hagar. Ishmael was born to him at the age of 86. Although the child did not come from, or did come from Abraham's body, Ishmael was not the promised seed. Abraham must wait until he's 100 years old or tw after 25 years of, from the time he entered Canaan before receiving the promised son. Another factor in the growth of Abraham's faith related to time was that he was able to observe that although God's promise might be slow in coming, he was always faithful to fulfill it. He had also experienced God's protection when he lied about his wife, Sarah, and put her in a precarious situation. Uh, God appeared to Abraham when he was 99 years old, and this is when God changes his name from Abraham to Abraham, telling him that he will be a father of a multitude of nations. Again, he promises that his seed will be given the land. Then God changes Sarah's name, her name was Sarai, changes Sarai's name to Sarah, saying that she will be a mother of nations. This is when Abraham laughs at the thought that a hundred year, that a hundred year old man and a 90 year old woman would have a child. He asked that uh, Ishmael might live, be the one. And God said, no, but Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son. You shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his seed after him. The promise is that he will be born about a year from this point. Shortly after this, the Lord had two angels appear. The Lord and two angels appeared to Abraham in the form of three men, and Abraham shows them great hospitality. As they speak with Abraham, Sarah is listening in the tent. The Lord says that in a year, Sarah will have a son. Sarah laughs in disbelief that they could have a child in her old age. But this time, Abraham does not laugh. The Lord says to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? The Lord repeats that at this time next year, Sarah will have a son. Abraham had grown strong in faith, giving glory to God, believing that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. At the appointed time the following year, Isaac was born. This was 25 years after Abraham had entered the land. He was 100 years old. God was faithful to give Abraham offspring. As Isaac grew at Sarah's request, Abraham sent his older son away with his mother, Hagar. And uh, the promised seed was the only one now in Abraham and Sarah's home. Probably Isaac had become a teenager when God tested Abraham with the most severe test of his life. This is when God tells Abraham, take your son, your only one, the one that you love, Isaac, and offer him as a burnt offering in a place that I will show you. There's no question from Abraham about, well, what about the promise? He, he, he doesn't question, uh, and, and, and he makes no delay. In fact, he rises early the next morning, saddles his donkey, splits the wood for the offering, takes Isaac and his two young men with him, and they start out for the place that God had told them. On the third day, Abraham sees the mountain that God had told him about, he uh, tells the young men to stay with the donkey. I and my son are going to go over there and worship. We'll return to you. So Isaac is carrying the wood, and Abraham's carrying the fire and the knife. And as they walk, uh, Isaac says, Behold, the fire and the wood, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham replies, God will provide for himself a lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham seems composed, certain. He has expressed confidence that the son will return and that God will provide the lamb. 
It is as though Abraham knows that God has made a promise regarding Isaac and that even though he kills him, he must raise him from the dead. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says, by faith, he, when he was tested, he offered up Isaac. It was he who received the promise, was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, to Isaac your descendants shall be called. And he considered that God was able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. You know the rest of the story. As Adam prepares to slay his son, the, the, Lord, the angel of the Lord stops him and says to Abraham, Now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only one, from me. Uh, and God really knew that Abraham would pass this test. But his works demonstrated his faith. As James says, his faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. James goes on to say that what Abraham did here was the fulfilling of the, of, of the scripture that says, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. There's a sense in which our faith is not complete until it, uh, until it blossoms out in good works. Abraham had passed the test. He demonstrated complete trust in God. God again repeats his promise. Indeed, I will greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply your seed as you, the stars of the heaven, and your seed shall possess the gate of his enemies to, in your gate. Uh, in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Now, I don't know if you noticed when I read that, it says, in the gate of his enemies, singular. Uh, it doesn't say that in the NESB, but it does in the LSB. And uh, in the Hebrew, it does. It, the, the word is his. Uh, and this fits with what Paul says that when, he, when, when it talks about seed, it's singular, referring to Christ. And I think that, that we have other, I, I think there's a reason for it saying his rather than there as though it were plural. This is anticipating the future salvation of the Gentiles, as Paul writes in Galatians, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you, and I, you and I become partners of the blessing of Abraham when we come to faith in Christ. And as we grow in our trust in God, uh, our works increasingly demonstrate our faith. I would recommend that you listen to uh, a lesson on the sanctifying faith of Abraham given by Omri Miles in our November the 18th uh, equipping hour. Sarah died at the age of 127. About three years later, Abraham acquires a wife for Isaac. This story reveals that both, uh, both the faith of Abraham and the providential guidance of Abraham's servant in procuring Isaac's wife. When Abraham ch uh, charges his uh, servant to go to Padan Aram to, uh, to get a wife from his relatives for Isaac, the servant says, well, suppose the woman is not willing to follow me to this land. Should I take your son back there? And, and Abraham warns him, no, you don't take him back. And then he expresses his faith. And uh, he, he recites the fact that God's promised him this land and his seed. And he says, God will send an angel before you and you will take a wife for my son from there. Abraham's servant prays for guidance and God providentially leads him to Rebekah, the daughter-in-law of Abraham's brother Nahor, the, gra the granddaughter rather of Abraham's brother Nahor. Her family recognized God's hand in this pursuit as they hear how this all worked out for the servant. And they permit Rebekah to go back to meet Isaac. And Isaac took Rebekah as his wife. And this was, I think I said, three years after his mother had died. And he was comforted uh, by his wife at this point. Abraham, after a remarriage and having more children, dies at the age of 175. And his sons, Isaac and Esau, uh, 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 Ishmael, rather, bury him alongside his wife, Sarah, in the plot of ground that he had bought from the, uh, the Hittites. This brings us to the eighth Toledot, the generations of uh, Ishmael. 
While Ishmael was not in the line of uh, the promised seed, uh, Abraham or God did bless him because of Abraham, and he settled uh, to the east of Isaac's descendants. The ninth Toledot is the generations of Isaac, and that begins with Abraham through Isaac to the twins that were born to Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Esau. Most of this section focuses on the third patriarch, that's Jacob, having, uh, again, barrenness requires divine intervention. And that's, that's been, uh, you know, Sarah was barren, so is so, uh, Rachel was, although she's not in the line, but, but uh, Rebecca is. And God, it, it's, it's amazing as you follow this line how many times it took God's intervention for this to happen. God answers by giving, or, or Rebecca is wondering what's going on in her, within her. There's a struggle in her womb, and, and God reveals that there's two nations in you, and the uh, younger will serve the old, the the older will serve the younger. This is before they're born. The truth of God's sovereign choice of Jacob over Esau is used by Paul in Romans nine to teach the the God's sovereign choice of his individuals for salvation over those that he passes by. There was nothing in Jacob that would have caused God to choose him over Esau. Actually, uh, he was a supplanter from his birth, grasping his brother's heel when he was first entered the world. And as the boys grew older, uh, Jacob bargains for uh, Esau's birthright, and uh, Esau despises his birthright and trades it off for a meal. Later, Jacob, under the direction of his mother, Rebekah, uh, I think she, he learned a little bit of uh, deceitfulness from her, perhaps. Uh, he stole Isaac's, uh, Esau's blessing by deceitfully pretending to be his brother. Isaac, thinking that this was, uh, it was his firstborn, blessed Jacob. This led to Esau's plotting to kill Jacob after Isaac died. So Rebekah plans to send Joseph away to Padan Aram until his, brother, his brother's uh, anger subsides. And so she plants in Isaac's mind the idea of sending Jacob back to Padan Abraham to get a wife. And uh, that's not too hard for Isaac to, to do because they, both he and Sarah are, have been very, quite grieved by the Canaanite uh, wives of their son uh, Esau. So J Jacob set out on his journey to spend some time with his uncle Laban. On the way, Jacob spends the night at Bethel. God appears to Jacob and makes the same seed promise that he made earlier to Abraham and to Isaac. He also promises to keep him wherever he goes and to bring him back to the land of Canaan. Jacob vows, if, if you keep your promise, you will be my God, and I will return a tenth of all that you have given me. Upon entering Padan Aram, Jacob immediately meets the girl who will become his favorite wife. He finds that his uncle Laban is every bit as deceitful as he himself is. After working for seven years to acquire Rachel as his wife, his uncle gives him her older sister Leah instead. And then he says, if you work another seven years for me, I will give you Rachel. So after 14 years of working for two wives, he needs to, uh, to increase his, uh, his real estate or his uh, property. And so he and Laban have a, an agreement uh, about animals that uh, uh, Jacob will take the uh, spotted and speckled uh, animals and Laban will keep the, the pure white ones. And uh, it seems that maybe Jacob is trying to do something a little bit deceitful there with the rods of almond, that, uh, stri stri stripe rods that he puts before the watering places and perhaps uh, feels that that will affect the outcome of the, the birth of the animals to make them more spotted. But I don't know how much that actually has an effect. Uh, it's very clear that God was the one that increased his flocks and uh, that, that his flocks outnumbered Laban's and pretty soon, Laban, uh, uh, Jacob starts realizing that his father-in-law is not friendly toward him. And uh, God speaks to him, it's time for you to go back to the land. So Jacob takes his wives 
his, their maids, his children, his flocks, and slips away without telling his father-in-law. And uh, of course, there's an encounter later between them, but uh, we, we, we won't take the time to go into that. Uh, Jacob comes near to the land of Canaan, and he's concerned about Esau. So he sends uh, messengers, and they come back with the good news. Your brother is coming with 400 men. And this strikes fear into Jacob's heart. And uh, he divides his group and his company into two groups and uh, sends them across the river, Jabbok River there. And, and uh, he's alone then. And, but he, he's, he prays to God, though. He says, Lord, O God of my father Abraham, the God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, return to your country and to your relatives, and I will prosper you. I am unworthy of all the, uh, the loving kindness and of the faithfulness with which you have shown me, your servant. For with my staff only I crossed the Jordan, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him. For I, he will come and attack me and my mo the mothers and the children. And, but for you said, I will surely prosper you and make you your descendants as the, sea to the, uh, the sand of the sea, which is too great to be numbered. So he's, he's, he's citing some of God's promises, but he's afraid and he's praying. And uh, that night, Jacob sent all that were with him across the river and he was alone. And a man comes and wrestles with him all night until daybreak. Uh, this man appears to, to not be able to prevail. Jacob prevails in the wrestling match. And so the, the man reaches over, touches Jacob's thigh and dislocates it. Now, he tells him, let me go because the, the, the sun is rising. Jacob says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So, uh, and, and by the way, we, we know now that this man is the Lord, and, uh, that he's come and he's, he's teaching Jacob a lesson here and he's doing something in Jacob's life. I don't think there's any question that the Almighty God could have pinned him immediately. <laughs> but uh, he, uh, he does wrestle with him. And uh, J Jacob, uh, then he's asked Jacob his name, and he says, uh, Jacob, and he says, well, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Jacob has been uh, too confident in his own uh, abilities. He's used deceit to achieve his, his ends. And God weakened Jacob physically, leaving a lasting result. It leaves him limping. And uh, as he walked, and he, he, uh, God is changing his chosen vessel into a different man. The, the name change, Jacob is supplanter, Israel is prince with God. We, we don't want you continuing being a supplanter, Jacob. Uh, I'm, I'm making you into a different man. And uh, also, you're going to have a weakness. You're going to depend on me. If you uh, would like to hear a, a very excellent sermon on this wrestling of, of Jacob with, with God, uh, Jerry Ragg has a, a, a great sermon. I think it was back in about 2016, I believe, uh, on GIBCJupiter.org, if you want to listen to it. I, I found it very, a very good lesson, very good message. So Jacob meets with Esau, and it, it's a cordial meeting. They're very friendly to each other. They, uh, uh, and and uh, Jacob settles in the land, and and uh, Esau goes back to back to Mount Seir, back to his area. And after the unfortunate incident, there's a or there's an un unfortunate incident that takes place. Dinah, one of Jacob's daughters, uh, was raped by one of the men in Shechem, 
and the brothers of her brothers are going to uh, take care of that. And of course, the, the man who who loved the daughter of Jacob uh, wanted to. He, he was agreeable to their. The, these brothers were deceitful too. They said, uh, you, you, well, "The only way we can intermarry is if you become circumcised like us." So they all just agreed. Okay, so they did. And then the third day, when they were very in great pain, these brothers come and kill them all. Well, D Jacob was not too happy about that, and he was afraid that. Now the Canaanites are going to gang up on us. And it was about this time that God tells Jacob to return to Bethel, where I first met you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. And uh, so they travel, as they travel to Bethel, the Bible says a terror fell on the cities around them and nobody pursued them. At Bethel, God appears to Jacob again, and he reminds Jacob of his new name, Israel. And he says, I am God Almighty. And he repeats his promise that nations will come from him, and, and the, the land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will give to you and your seed. And not too long after this, Rachel dies, giving birth to his 12th son, Benjamin. And, uh, okay. I see that we're running out of time. Now, Smed went over 10 minutes. Uh, I, <laughs> I'm going to try to finish. In less than, well, in 10 minutes at least. <laughs> we now come to the, uh, you know, I, I know that Smed, you, I know that you said uh, 50 minutes sharp. But I follow examples rather than instructions. <laughs> but anyone's free to leave if you have to. <laughs> uh, we, so now we come to the, uh, oh, Ra actually Rachel dies giving birth and then Jacob's father Isaac dies at the age of 180 and both he and Esau bury him. And now we come to the 10th and 11th Toledotes and that's in chapter 36, and those are both Esau, uh, the generations of Esau when he's in Canaan and the generations of Esau when he was in Edom. And uh, he takes his three wives and all that he has and goes to, moves to Edom. So actually he leaves the land of Canaan, so he's leaving it for Jacob, for the, 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 the land that's going to be his or his descendants. Esau had many prominent sons, just like God promised. And uh, you might remember that after the Exodus, when the children of Israel were coming back to the land, uh, the, to the, God would not allow them to attack Edom because J uh, Esau was Jacob's brother. Uh, this will bring us to our final Toledot, the 12th one. And this is the generations of Jacob. And it takes us to the end of Genesis. And... Uh, this, the, the first character in this is Joseph. He's, he's the main focus on the first part of this Toledo. And uh, Joseph was uh, probably a teenager. He was a teenager at the time that he was there with his family. And uh, he was a favorite son of Jacob. And there was jealousy. The brothers didn't like him. And then he had a dream that he would be ruling over them. And they hated him even worse. In fact, so bad that they tried to kill him. They were going to kill him, and Reuben was uh, intervened. He said, no, let's just put him in this pit. And his idea was that he would get him out of there and send him back to his father. But meanwhile, Judah uh, said, sees some traitors come in, and he says, well, hey, let's take him and sell him to the traitors. There's, what profit is there in killing him? Here's some money reason for this. We'll, we'll make some money here selling him to the, the Midianites. So Jacob is taken, or Joseph is taken down to Egypt, and uh, he is sold to Potiphar, who is a captain of the bodyguard for Pharaoh. Uh, in in uh, Potiphar's house, uh, Joseph is quite, he, he prospers. God blesses him. He's with him. And when Potiphar sees how things prosper under his hand, he puts the, his whole house in charge. And But... Uh, not only does Potiphar see him, but so does his wife see him as a rather nice-looking Hebrew young man, and she, see, she seeks to uh, seduce him. 
He refuses. She seeks more strongly to seduce him. And he's, he flees. He's falsely accused. He's cast into prison. So here again, another injustice in the life of Joseph. While there, he, uh, Pharaoh became angry with two of his workers, his cupbearer and his uh, baker, and put him in prison. Joseph was in, by the way, when he was in charge uh, in, in prison, he was in charge of the prisoners. Uh, the same thing. God was with him. God prospered him uh, wherever he went. And uh, these two guys had dreams, and J uh, Joseph interpreted both of them, making it clear that this, it's God that gives the interpretation. And, uh, and the, the baker lost his life, and the cupbearer was restored to Pharaoh. And it was two years later when Pharaoh had a dream, and nobody could interpret it. And that's when the, the cupbearer tells Pharaoh about Joseph. And Pharaoh brings him out of prison. He, can, he makes it clear that God is telling you something that's going to happen. And he interprets the dream. Seven years of, fam of uh, good and prosperity are coming and followed by seven years of famine. And, I, and then he gives him counsel, gives Pharaoh counsel. Let's take, uh, get, find somebody to be in charge of this, to gather up a lot of grain during those good years so we'll have it during the, the bad years. So that's when Pharaoh is, uh, puts Joseph as second in command in the land of Egypt. And he's over this. And as Joseph, uh, by the way, Joseph was... Uh, Let's see, he, he was 30 years old when this happened. So that he's, for more than 10 years, he's been suffering from mistreatment, uh, injustice, and, uh, and, and finally he's, he's in a place that really is the reason that God had him come down. And he, he, uh, Pharaoh realizes that God is with him and puts him in this, this position, and pretty soon the famine came. And uh, it was not only in Egypt, but it was in all the land around. And uh, it was in Canaan, where, the, where Jacob and his sons were. And so they come to Egypt to buy get grain. This is when, the, when Joseph recognizes them. They do not recognize Joseph in his uh, Egyptian clothes. And, uh, and so J Joseph is going to test them. And so he accuses them of being... I better stand by the mic here. Uh, <laughs> The, the, uh, he's going to test them in, in, in three ways. He's, he's going to test them. First of all, he's going to accuse them of being spies, and then they reveal a little bit about their father and their, their younger brother. And he uh, tells them that you, next time you come, you need to bring your younger brother with you. And uh, so uh, he, he tests first their integrity, puts their money back in their, their grain sacks. And as they go back, they, they, they're kind of dismayed when they see that. And uh, so they come, uh, the time passes, they run out of food. Jacob says, go back and buy food. And he, they said, well, we're not going to. He says, we can't even buy food if we don't bring our younger brother. Well, eventually Jacob gives in to it. And uh, they take him down. And uh, Joseph recognizes him. And uh, he, he, he has him stay with, with him for dinner. And he gives Benjamin five times as much food. He's going to test their jealousy. Are you going to be jealous of this younger brother like you were me? And uh, there's no sign of jealousy. And, uh, and then he's, he, he tries one more test. I'm going to test their loyalty to their father. So he puts a cup in Benjamin's sack. And on the way back to uh, home, they, they, uh, Joseph sends some servants out to bring him back. And accuses them of stealing his cup. And uh, whoever's cup has that cup is going to be my slave. Well, this, this is a test. And it's interesting that J uh, Judah is the one who was glad to sell Joseph into Egypt. But Judah also is the one that goes to bat for his brother Benjamin and says, It will kill my father if you keep him here. I'll stay here in his place. So Joseph has found that these brothers have changed. He reveals himself to them. And this is when uh, Joseph 
and and when he when he tells them who he is, they 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 can't even talk. They're stunned. And he says, "Come closer." And he tells them, he says, "Do, do not be afraid, for I am for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good." in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. Joseph understood the truth of Romans 28, 28, long before Paul wrote it. He was looking at the big picture of what God is doing and not the myopic view of what happened to him. Joseph also believed that the promises of God to Abraham that the uh, Hebrews would return to their own land. So he charges his brothers to have his bones brought back when they returned to Canaan. If you'd like to hear more of the life of Joseph, I'd recommend that you listen to the equipping our uh, resources, God's Providence in the Life of Joseph by Steve Kovac. That was three parts a while back. God is faithful to bring to pass his intended purpose in the unfolding of history, and this includes the bringing forth of his seed through, the, uh, through which he accomplishes plan of redemption, as well as the transformation of the recipients of redemption in the, pre in the present age. Christ is building his church. Even though there are many adversaries and the world seems to be so chaotic, Christ will not fail to build his church. He will call everyone he will call everyone whom he has chosen before the foundation of the world, justify them, and conform them to the image of his son. All right. Ten minutes exactly. You are dismissed.